Hello. Thank you for making the choice to join us here at the Greenbrier Church Online. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been doing a very non-scientific study. In the conversations that I've had with people, I've tried to steer the discussion into what makes us happy or what's keeping us from being happy. What I've discovered is that most of us are just not enjoying life. I think a lot of that discontent comes from what we see on social media, from scrolling through Facebook or Snapchat. It seems that every post is from another person who is living their best life. Each and every one of them are lying about how perfect their life is, and in comparison, the fact that our lives just don't really measure up. They have the perfect children. They're always well-behaved. Their daughter hit the game-winning home run. Their son made the game-winning basket. And they both make straight A's. They have the perfect wife whose makeup is always flawless. She just lost another three pounds. She keeps up with the laundry and she bakes the perfect cake. And then there's the perfect husband who always helps clean up around the house. All of the furniture he made by hand. He works 40 hours a week and never forgets to bring home flowers. When we look at the lies that are told on social media, we begin to believe, you know, if I could just change my situation a little bit, then life would be great. If I could just get rid of all of my problems, then I could finally be happy. But regardless of what you see on social media, there's no such thing as a problem-free, perfect life. People spend hours on social media creating this false narrative when the truth is they have bad hair days, they spill coffee on their shirts, they miss flights, their children throw tantrums in the middle of a Walmart. They just never post the truth because the truth doesn't get you likes and follows. We seemed hardwired to chase after happiness. I mean, we're even promised in our Declaration of Independence that we have an unalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we seem to constantly be pursuing happiness. And it constantly remains just out of reach. I told you last week that if I were able to write this church a letter to express my love and my gratitude, I would want to write the book of Philippians. There's such a beautiful spirit about this letter, but the truth is the spirit of the letter doesn't line up with reality. You see, Paul wrote the letter, and over the last four years, his life has been miserable. He spent two years in a prison in Caesarea for some trumped-up charge. He is put on a ship, sent off to Rome. On the way, the ship is shipwrecked. They're stranded on an island. He's bitten by a viper. He finally makes it to Rome where he spends another two years in a Roman prison. And every day, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, he's chained to a Roman guard. He has no privacy whatsoever. Nobody is going to post what Paul is going through on social media with the hashtag, best life ever. Yet Paul is still able to say, I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. Paul's discovered the secret of true joy while chained to a guard in prison. In that moment, he remains happy and positive and joyful. In our text this morning, Paul shares three secrets to finding real joy. And the first secret is that God has a purpose behind every one of my problems. I'm going to share your closest guarded secret. Your life is not perfect. You have problems and issues. But let me let you in on another secret. The way that you look at that problem is much more important than the actual problem itself. Your perspective makes all the difference. Look at what Paul says in Philippians 1, starting in verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers, that What has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Paul had always wanted to go to Rome. He wanted to go there and share the good news of Jesus with the people living in that city. 
But instead of going and starting a church, teaching in the synagogues and around the city, God takes Paul to Rome and puts him in prison. That's not Paul's choice. It's not a part of his plan. But God has a purpose in Paul's problem. You understand that if Paul hadn't been in prison, it's doubtful that he would have ever found the time to write these letters to the churches he established which means we wouldn't have 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Timothy. We wouldn't have had Philemon. Also, he wouldn't have found himself chained to a palace guard 24 hours a day. These palace guards are the highest paid employees in the entire Roman Empire. They would work for 12 years and retire when they would become leaders in Rome. There's not a more strategic group that Paul could share the gospel with if he's going to reach the Roman Empire. So God takes Paul, puts him in Rome, and chains him to people where he can talk about Jesus every day. Paul could have sulked in the fact that he wasn't getting his way. He could have complained because his life wasn't made up of gumdrops, lollipops, unicorns, and rainbows. He could have even lost his faith because God refused to follow the script that Paul had written out in his mind. But instead, Paul is able to see these problems, these issues, as just another opportunity to share the gospel. Every struggle, every hardship, every problem is God allowing Paul to do kingdom work. Paul found his joy in his understanding that God has a purpose behind every issue, struggle, in problem. The second secret to finding real joy is that we need to learn how to focus on the things that really count. When things get tough, when life's not turning out the way that I planned, that's when we need to take a step back and figure out what's trivial in life and what's the most significant. I've noticed in my own life that I often find myself going around putting out all of these small fires. I put out one fire after another fire, and I end up neglecting the most important thing. Let's pick up our text in verse 15. Paul says, It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry. Nothing steals your joy quicker than when somebody criticizes you. And not just criticizes you when they do it unfairly. When somebody criticizes the way that you parent and their kids are hoodlums, it's infuriating. When you're unjustly criticized, it takes up all of this mental space and energy. You want to pick that other person apart because you know they're also not perfect. You get angry because there's all of these things that if you were just quicker on your feet, you would have said, you should have said. You begin to lose focus on what really counts. Paul knew that there were people out there in the world criticizing him, making false statements, just outright lying about him. But look at what he says in verse 18. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. There's an awful lot of maturity in that statement. It takes an awful lot of character and wisdom to know that people are being ugly about you and your response to their ugliness is, what does it matter? As long as Christ is preached, we're all good. Paul is not going to allow anybody to steal his joy, not in his circumstances, definitely not as critics. Nothing can rip the joy away from Paul's life, because these people that are trying to steal his joy, they didn't understand what Paul knew about life in the kingdom. Paul wasn't living for them. He wasn't living for their approval. He was living for the applause of heaven. Paul had set his priorities and his values on heaven, and he's not going to allow all these little things, insignificant things, to steal his joy. Let me get a little closer to home here for a moment. How many arguments have you had with your friends over something that at the time seemed really, really important? But here you are six weeks, six months later, and you realize you were fighting over something that was insignificant and pointless. 
What about the arguments with the folks you work with? Things that at the moment seem so very important, so vital, but now it doesn't really matter that much at all. How many arguments have you had with your husband or wife over things that are life-altering, right? Like, what color are we going to paint the bedroom? Or where they left their shoes? Or not being able to find the catch-up? Or what you said when you were hungry? We have this innate ability to damage our relationships when we over-focus on the things that don't really matter. There's this old adage that I say quite often, you can be right or you can be happy. There's some truth to that. Everything in your life is not life or death. Everything doesn't have eternal significance. If we want to be joyful, we have to fix our eyes on the thing that really matters, the things that really count, and just allow the other stuff to fade away. The third secret to finding joy is claiming a purpose worth living for. Most days we're just flat wore out. I mean, how many nights do you finally get to bed and you're just drained? Some days it seems like we've just faced one crisis after another crisis and we're ready to just throw in the towel. Paul understood what it was to be tired and hurt. I mean, people lied about Paul a lot. He was beaten a lot. He was thrown into jail a lot. They were even times that they stoned him and left him for dead. Right now he's been in prison for four years. They've taken everything from him, his friends, his freedom, his privacy. But you know there's one thing they can't take from him? That's his purpose. Look at what he says in verse 21. For me to live is Christ and die is gain. Paul's not afraid of death because he's already put his will and his old life to death. Right now, he's living for Christ and Christ alone. He lives to serve God and to do the will of God. He's ready to go home. He says, at any moment, I'm ready to go home. But God, as long as you allow me to stay here, I'm going to devote my life to living for Christ. So I wonder today, how would you finish that statement? For me to live is... I think some of us would have to admit, for me to live is possessions. We want to accumulate as much as we can. We, we buy things we don't need with money that we don't have to impress people that we don't even like. We struggle with greed. We struggle with gluttony, thinking that if I could just get a little more, then I will finally find that joy that eludes me. You work so hard to keep up with the Joneses, and just about the time that you catch up with them, they refinance, and you're in trouble all over again. Some of us need to admit that for me to live is pleasure. If it feels good, we do it. We chase after anything that will give us just a little bit of pleasure. Our pride causes us to envy and to lust after these things that will relieve our boredom, but it just relieves us for a moment. That pleasure doesn't last. Eventually, Monday rolls around again and we're back at work and life is still the pits. Some of us need to admit that for me to live is power, position, prestige, popularity. I mean, we dress for success. We drive to impress. We pay for our power lunch with our power card. Image is everything. It's not just teenagers who hunger for a little popularity. All adults do things we don't want to do just so we can fit in with the peer group. We've all been tempted to lower our standards so that people will notice us, only to go to our 20-year high school reunion and discover that nobody even remembers our names. The problem with possessions and pleasure and power is that they can't last. Not a lifetime, much less an eternity. There's not ultimate fulfillment if that were true, then the people who had the most pleasure would be the happiest people in the world. The people who could afford to have the most experiences would be the most joy-filled. But they're not, because they're miserable. A lot. Always looking for and craving and chasing after just a little more. Paul could have could find real joy in his life because he has this long-term goal. He looks at everything in light of eternity. 
He understood that the best use of his life was to invest it in something that would outlive him. I love the fact that I was invited by God to be his child. I love that I'm a Christian, but I'm not a Christian because I'm afraid I'm going to die tonight. I'm a Christian because I'm going to have to live tomorrow. I'm convinced that the reason there's so much unhappiness in our culture, so many discouraged and depressed people, is because in our society we are so over-preoccupied with ourself. What's best for me? What's going to make me happy? How can I achieve something better? How can I get more acclaim? When you learn to have a greater purpose in your life than just yourself, you'll discover that you have more joy than you can handle. There's no such thing as living a problem-free life, but I've discovered when you base your life on the kind of values that will outlive you, Your problems just aren't as significant. It's not that big a deal that things haven't worked out the way that I planned. God has a purpose for my life that's bigger than my problems. I believe that God wants us to enjoy our lives, but it starts with the foundational values that we're talking about this morning. You need a purpose to live for. Can you sum up the purpose of your life in a single sentence? I think we all want to live a long life, but why? Life is not judged by its duration. It's judged by what you do with your life and how you bless other people with your life. I mean, so many people that I know are giving first-class allegiance to second-class causes, and those causes are betraying them. They climb the ladder to success, and they get to the top, and they find out that it's leaning against the wrong wall. You say... Is this all there is? I gave my life for this? What a waste. Other people, they don't care about you. While you're so busy trying to impress everybody, they're not even watching you. They're obsessed with looking at themselves. So don't worry about what other people think. So I wonder today, how do you complete the sentence? For me to live is what? I'm going to suggest that there's only one answer to that blank. There's only one answer that's going to matter 50 years from now, 100 years from now. You're going to spend more of your life on the other side of death than you will ever spend on this side of death. Paul is talking to us about having a relationship with the one who made you. God designed and created you for a purpose. You're not here by an accident. You do more than merely take up space. When you begin to live for Christ, that's when you discover your purpose. That's when you finally find the real joy in life. God invites you into a relationship with Him. He invites you to take a seat at His table. And we go to the table today to be reminded that for Christ, to live was to fulfill the will of God. The death, the resurrection, makes that relationship possible. Like Paul, we go to the table today not to claim that to live is a religion or a church or a Bible study or a ministry. We gather at the table to say that the only thing worth living for is to have a relationship with the one who created me, redeemed me, and sustained me. I really hope that as you go to the table today and you take the bread and you take the cup, You take some time to give honest reflection to the joy that either you have in your life or the joy that eludes you. And I hope you're able to be honest enough to to honestly answer, for me to live is... And if the answer to that is not Christ, then maybe today you can take some time in reflection and repentance. Maybe today as you take communion, you need to think about and pray that God will give you the power and the courage and the strength to make your life all about Him. I hope you have a wonderful week. And I hope today is the beginning of a journey that will help you get closer to Christ and find ultimate joy in living for Him. Have a great week. I look forward to seeing you very soon.